podcast about putting your data to work in some of the most complex use cases in the world. Today, I'm really excited to welcome a guest and longtime friend, Floyd Christofferson. Floyd, welcome to Data Unchained. Thanks, Molly. It's great to be here. So, Floyd, I think for those who do not know you, even though I think many of the folks who listen to this show will, would you talk a little bit about your career history in data management and unstructured data? Sure. Actually, my history with content management and managing unstructured data crosses both media and entertainment and high-performance computing. And, and it's very interesting because this problem is ubiquitous across multiple industries. And the net of it is the more files you have, especially when you're dealing with workflows where you have to produce a product in media and entertainment, maybe it's a show or collaborating with people, or in high-performance computing, it's, it's a scientific outcome. The problem is, is that there's multiple different types of storage that are required to do this, and multiple different people and places where you have to manage this. And so the holy grail through this journey has been, how do you, how do you manage to move those files, or better said, make those files available across the different stages of their workflow to the different important people that have to do it. As you think about this evolution and seeking the Holy Grail, Floyd, um, you know, I know I met you back when you were working in the HPC space on you know, evangelizing the importance of metadata. I think that was the first thing I really heard you talking passionately about. It wasn't just the storing. It wasn't just the structure, but it was creating the metadata. Maybe you can talk about thinking back. I think this is rewinding maybe a decade or two, but why were you so passionate about metadata? Because that is the roadmap. That's the ability to get at the data without having to, especially if you're dealing with massive amounts of data, without having to physically move it everywhere. In other words, inevitably, there's multiple different types of storage over the life cycle of the data, different use cases for the data different actors that may need to interact with that data. And if every time you had to move that data to a different storage type or to a different share or to a different somewhere else, the, the, the friction of that workflow just grows exponentially. And especially over time, whatever storage the data is born on, it will have to move somewhere. And so with metadata, it's, you're able to up the level. You're able to look across all of that. You're able to make interaction with the data at an abstraction layer above it. So you can make decisions. You can make policy decisions. You can do all kinds of things without having to physically move all that data. So in the quest for the holy grail that you talked about, as you think about over the last 10 or 20 years, has metadata been something that has been fairly vendor specific or has it been something that can be applied across systems, across data storage environments? In many ways, and there's multiple types of metadata, but at the base level, the file system metadata, and which is re represented in the actual file system, which if you think about it, you know, a file system is metadata that translates raw bits on disk somewhere into a file that a user in an application can interact with. That metadata is tremendously um, vendor specific. If I have, if I'm looking at a at a, a file system on a NetApp, um, and I need to be able to move that over to an object store or to an Isilon, I'm having to copy both the metadata and that file to a different platform. Okay, so I can see where you have more data, more data systems that has added complexity in how to accomplish the goal of smart metadata to work with. That makes sense. Um, I think back to the days where you and I were founding with a couple of other peers, the Active Archive Alliance. In a lot of cases, that was about bringing to life your archive, making your archive not a rusty, kind of dusty archive, like thinking of the National Archives that you have to go dust off a book, but bringing life to your archive systems. And 
when I think about that, there was, I was more on the side of how do you do it cost effectively? I was the company I represented at the time was into high capacity, low cost storage, while your role was a lot talking about metadata. Um, but as you think about active archive, we took a step as an industry from difficult to access archives to more active with metadata about that archive, but it was still vendor specific. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's, and that gets to the second aspect of metadata is that, you know, I mean, in a digital world, any file should not, in an archive, you shouldn't have to go like in a dusty library and pull it off a shelf. It should be available to you. And so what is the limitation to being available to you? First of all, access to the file system where it lives and the different storage silos that it may live in. But secondly, knowing what it is, right? And so this is where you get layers of metadata, which if you can aggregate them into a system, you, that, that is really the holy grail. So the file system itself, so that you can bridge different locations, you can bridge different silos of vendor uh, silos of storage, but then rich metadata, which might be specific to a department or a job ID or you know, a user or other sorts of metadata. So the, as you writ, enrich in that metadata stack, and decouple it from the silos, now you can get to that holy grail of an active archive or active data. The word archive ceases to mean anything because the data can live where it needs to live, move when it needs to move, but always be findable and accessible by users and applications for whatever they may be doing. I think it'd be helpful to talk a little bit about the technologies that are out there today. Um, maybe some of them are a little bit more legacy, some are a little bit more modern than others. We've talked a bit about file systems and some of this capability can build, be built into something like ONTAP from NetApp, you know, one of us from Isilon, whoever it might be. Um, but then there's also data management technologies that are a third party solution who a company may bring in to supplement what a single vendor provider can do. Can you maybe just summarize what those third party technologies look like? In the 90s, when, when you were, wanted to share a file with somebody, the file system was locked in the operating system. You had to put it on a floppy disk, hand it over the wall to somebody, and now they could put it into their file system. NetApp, with ONTAP, they revolutionized that by putting that file system up onto the network. So now everybody could share the same files. And Isilon <clears throat> took that to the next level and expanded it out beyond. The problem was now... Every storage vendor, and there were many, of course, that came along, had their own file system. And so this is where supplemental data management came into place, because each of these file systems, you might have an environment with, with NetApp and Isilon and other things. Every one of those required copy management. It required tiering management. It required other sorts of maybe different data protection strategies that needed to be applied for each of those different file systems and different storage types. And so point solutions around data migration or tiering or even analysis of data is how active is the data on that storage versus and should it belong on a, on a less uh, expensive storage over here. All of these layers of point solutions were, were necessitated by the fact that you had all of these multiple file systems and silos and were having to orchestrate data between them all. So that seems really complicated. If I were an IT manager, my head would probably be swimming at the data management, the tools, maintaining security, all of those different pieces. Um, how, how would the third party tools help with that? Were there Are there good tools out there today that can help to tier across vendors, maybe you want to move from a NetApp, let's just say, into the cloud, things like that, where it's maybe not a NetApp native tool. Are there good tools for that today, or is there kind of a gap in how to manage that data? There are good tools, but often those tools are locked into a vendor's storage ecosystem. So you may, so you may for example, be able to do some sort of a global file system as long as you're within the, the ecosystem or the walled garden of that vendor's storage, uh, which is, I mean, it's by design. Uh, you know, the vendor wants to keep their customers within their walled garden. How did the introduction of the cloud affect this industry? You know, we, we definitely 
know the cloud has had massive impact in many different ways. And you just think about it's yet another vendor specific storage solution, certainly, whether it's AWS or Azure, or whoever it is. Is it really just another storage pool and you have the same com complexities or are there new complexities that entered with the cloud? It's a bit of both, NetApp and Isilon and similar. These, the scale was limited to the data center, but you had a distance problem. If you had another data center somewhere else, you had a gap um, and that latency between the gap created problems. The innovation that Amazon with S3 storage and then subsequently other cloud vendors was as it decoupled the file system um, and, and created a global cloud scale uh, object store so that now the file system wasn't limited to a data center, but could be collaborated. So the second half of that is, of, of your question is where this comes into play, because yes, that now created an even bigger silo problem. Because you now had this global capability, not only did you have to figure out how to get data effectively, not just get data, but use data that might live part of it in the cloud, part of it on-prem, but also what about data that might live in one data center and another on-prem data center elsewhere and in one or multiple clouds or one or multiple cloud regions? So now this silo problem just as the data grew, and just as all of the, the, the choices of storage grew, the silo problem grew exponentially. So the silo problem is tough on IT, certainly, as we've talked about, tough to manage. From a business perspective, data silos are a really big pain point because you can't monetize your data. You have less access to your entire organization's data set for research, innovation. I think that that's one of the areas that sometimes we lose sight of in our industry is we think so much about the IT side, but you know, businesses are all around using data to innovate now. And that just continues to add to that pain point, I would think as well. Absolutely. In order to effectively run analytics or BI or other sorts of ML sort of tools, on data, and if that data is scattered across all m multiple different resources or locations, if your only choice is to aggregate all of that data into a repository somewhere, then that's a lot of friction. It's extra cost, it's extra management, it's, it's, it's wasted capacity. But what if, you know, to, to go back to that, what if that data could live anywhere? And at the metadata layer, you are now able to see and have that global view of all that data across all of those different locations, whether they're data silos or just simply physical locations. Now, you've, because you're, the metadata is cheap, it's light, you can, you can move it around and you can see it. But if from that metadata layer, you can see those common files across, uh, across vendor silos, now, utilization of that data, it goes up. Your wait time for results goes way down. Um, your efficiency in managing your infrastructure uh, goes way up. Your, your complexity that is driving up operational costs goes down. And so the net of it all is you get better use of your data, better use of your resources. I'd like to talk about what does that look like today? We talked about the innovation from NetApp into Isilon into S3. I know I've seen, I've read, and a lot of reason I have you on the show is talking about global data environments. Do you see that as that next step in the innovation kind of trajectory? Absolutely, I do. The storage industry has always been trying to keep up with how people come up with ways to use their data, and data has grown as a result. And the problem is, is that small silos became big, and innovation comes along. But now the entire world is digital in a distributed environment. And unless you can solve this problem to bridge all and, and provide ubiquitous access, regardless of which storage vendor, regardless of which location, then there's gonna, that, that creates huge friction into really being effectively able to use your data. Are global data environments a reality today? Is that something we're looking to provide over the coming years? I believe they are. I mean, the concept of a global data environment is not specific to a vendor. Um, people will create global data environments without really intending to. 
just by the simple fact that they have to share their resources across different locations. But it usually involves a lot of manual effort. And so, yes, people are working globally now. You've got workers and people who are, are working from home or distributed uh, offices, whatever that may be, all of this. And this all creates the need for a global and data environment. The real trick is, is it a manual, siloed, heavily complex process, or is it something that you can apply automation to, to unify access to? So Floyd, are there any specific recommendations you would give to customers who are specking out their distributed or global data environments today? If you're coming up with a solution to reduce the complexity of distributed environments or bridge silos or create this kind of global data environment to rationalize your, your, your storage, your data management, your utilization, I think that as you evaluate solutions, the biggest thing to be careful of is, is it, does it lock you in to a particular uh, vendor storage or a particular uh, storage ecosystem? I think, because that's where things tend to become a problem. And, pe and that's where the word data gravity or storage gravity comes from, is because people get locked into a particular solution. And now, whether they want to or not, they can't afford to leave because the, the, the inertia is too great. So as, as I've looked at solutions around this, this problem from straight HSM tiering type of solutions to metadata driven data management solutions to you name it across the board over time, those that seem to be the most effective for people are those that they can not get locked into a particular storage type or a particular storage vendor. So how does that work? You select a tool for your global data environment that's not vendor specific, um, but you still need to buy storage. Your data has to sit somewhere, whether it's a cloud or a vendor. How do those two concepts come together? Think of the life cycle of the data. When the data is first created, it's, it's active, it's hot, um, and depending on the work use case, it might need to stay in hot storage. But typically, this, you know, that data won't be hot for very long. And now it's got to move somewhere, right? And so as you look across your real utilization of storage, and if, if, you know, you've, if you've got 90% 90, 90 of your data that is sitting in, in the most expensive storage but only uh, and highest performance storage, but only 10% of that really needs to live there, then you're wasting a huge amount of money that could be gone into a second tier storage or an object storage or somewhere some, some other storage type. And so the freedom to be able to pick from different price bands and performance bands for your data profile over its life cycle is the key to that vendor neutrality. And then, and then how to manage the process of making all of that seamless between them so that users, you're not creating uh, interruption to user workflow to figure out where their data is. So this kind of reminds me of concepts like global namespaces, global file systems that would maybe glue together the vendor specific storage pools that you've created. Does that There's things like symbolic links that might be used to repoint people from one place to another or global file systems that are tied into a particular storage. All of those things can get very fragile over time. Um, and that's again, if you get into vendor specific sim links or you know, vendor locked file systems, then that's where, that's where problems can emerge. So I think that could make a great second episode with you, Floyd, as we talk about global file systems and the ways different companies are trying to solve this issue. I'd love it if you'd come back and do another show with us at some point in the future. Would love to. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Data Unchained, powered by Hammerspace. To learn more, visit hammerspace.com. If you have a guest you would like to hear on the show, email me at molly at hammerspace.com. Oh,